Mr. Veselin de Broda was born in Bratoshkovsi, near Skradin Shibenik, Yugoslavia, on June 1, 1918. His father, Damian, was a teacher, and his mother, Yana, a housewife. There were six children in the family. Unfortunately, all except Veselin and Bogoyev died at various stages of their lives. Slobodin died as a child of six. Velomir was in his second year of university. Sister Bosilka was 29. And another brother, Reiko, was 43. Brother Bogoyev currently lives in Belgrade. Mr. Dobroda finished his public school in his hometown, high school and teacher's college in the nearby Shibenik. Upon receiving his teaching certificate, he was drafted into the army in Maribor in 1940. When the German war machine finally struck Yugoslavia in 1941, Veselin was just completing his officer's training. What was life like in your hometown before the war? Uh, my village was very uh, uh, nice. Nature was beautiful. And uh, I wanted to bring a little bit more culture. Uh, there were very many people who were illiterate, and uh, I wanted uh, to that they learn how to write and read. And I did uh, have one course for those people who didn't know how to write and read and uh, attended about 40. And they were all successful and very grateful. All, all this was done through the Sokol organization. And I found that unit in my village, uh, devo devotion boys to the exercises, in a healthy body, healthy spirit. That was the motto of the organization. Uh, I loved it. I did uh, build uh, uh, Sokolska Chesma, and uh, we gave name to that King Alexander of Yugoslavia. Uh, Sokolska Chesma was fountain for the water because water was uh, rare in the village. And also, I, I uh, was this did succeed to uh, plant 300 fruit trees in one part of the village, which was given to us by the community of Skradi. Uh, property belonged to them. And I did build also Sokolsky Dome on the property of Monastery Krka. Monastery Krka was about 20 kilometers from us. It was a very old monastery. They had some property in our village. They had wine yards. They had uh, olive trees. They were quite uh, wealthy. All these uh, was given to them by the donated to them by the people of uh, uh, who were very good uh, believers and uh, in 1938 I went, was sent to Belgrade at a seminar and I attended uh, at uh, Kolarchev University there and uh, I gathered the strength and I went to see Radmilo Grzic, who was secretary of the Sokol of Kingdom of Yugoslavia. I uh, begged him to give me some money to build the Sokolski Dome that is similar to this, but naturally in the smaller, uh, smaller dimensions. And he listened uh, with very uh, good understanding and he allowed me that day approved loan 10,000 dinars. 10,000 dinars in those days were very big money. So we did build up. And uh, uh, we had big celebration for uh, uh, consecration of the uh, dome and uh, for uh, 
Sokolska Chesma were quite, uh, were about thousand people presented. And first time in my village appeared a plaque, how do you call that, music uh, with, uh, like you have military musics here. A band? A band, mm -hmm. a band. Uh, but uh, 15, 20 people, and what's called Sokolska, Sokolska, Sokolska Muska. So mm -hmm. that was quite celebration. Mm -hmm. And this fountain that, that you built uh, for for the town, was that a fountain for people to get water from? Yes. Or was it? No, no. It was a fountain for people to get water from. I see. It was a very nice region, and there are, uh, you have the pictures of that. Mm -hmm. I, I gave you the pictures. Mm -hmm. I gave you the pictures uh, taken on the day of the consecration. Of the fountain? Yeah, fountain. And of the soccer and the, and the And the uh, building. I see. Um, when the war... All my time, all my time as a student, I was attending teacher's college and uh, high school in Shibenik, and all my free time I devoted to this kind of the work. Mm -hmm. To any other thing, but uh, not to the girls, not to anything. <laughs> that is <laughs> just my part of, of the living, that's all. <laughs> and you uh, graduated from Teachers College? I graduated from Teachers College, that is in 1940. Mm -hmm. Did you start teaching after that? No, unfortunately, <clears throat> the war uh, broke. Uh, actually, 19, this graduation was in June. In September, I joined a school for officers in reserve, which was conscription. You didn't, uh, you couldn't say no, because you have to finish that before you get any job. And that was 45 in uh, in September, and in April, uh, 40, uh, no, 45, 45, no, 41. Uh, Yes. And it was 40, 1940, I'm mixing, <laughs> I'm mixing the date, 1940. And in April 1941, Germany declared war to Yugoslavia, and we were right on the border at Maribor. I think I started, uh, you have that, mm -hmm. at Maribor. And we were taken from Maribor to Travnik. And we st uh, were stationed there for a few days, we ordered the move, and we went to, to Mrkonjici Grad, where we met with the German units, and we were dispersed uh, after a few hours of the fight. How were you? How were you dispersed? Dispersed. Uh, well, we just uh, gave up. We couldn't. Uh, we couldn't find fight because we were, we didn't have any tank or anything. And where they the had people, and they were superior, much superior in a, uh, uh, in. A, Te techniques and uh, you know the most modern more uh, arms uh, of the time. They had tanks. Oh, they had, had tanks. That is first time that I ta saw tank uh, <laughs> in reality. I saw them before at the pictures, but mm -hmm. on the pictures, but never, never. I see. And how did you escape? Well, uh, we. Uh, I think uh, the ninety percent of the uh, of us escaped, and we took uh, a route to go towards Sarajevo, hoping always to join other units because we didn't know, we didn't have uh, good uh, communications or, uh, you know, as today you have radio communications uh, about the movements and so on, we didn't, we didn't have anything. So we took uh, towards Sarajevo and uh, we heard from the villagers that uh, they are not harming people, uh, they are uh, soldiers, former soldiers, that they are letting them go. So we decided, a few of us decided to go to Sarajevo, and uh, there, before Sarajevo, there is a station, we boarded a train. Nobody asked us for any papers or anything to go toward the Adriatic, uh, Adriatic Sea, and we went uh, to Gabela. And that was crossroads, which goes for Herzegovina, 
or for Dalmatia. Um, but uh, for Dalmatia, there weren't very good connections, so we decided to go on foot. And we came, few of us, to Vrkorac. You were headed for Dal uh, Dalmatia? Dalmatia, yes. Why, uh, why were you headed there? Because I was Dalmatian. You were I wanted to go to my village if I would be able mm -hmm. and successful. And um, um, after we made a few kilometers, we met some villagers, and one villager approached me and asked me to exchange my uniform. And I uh, was a little bit hesitant, but uh, I did, and I got very poor civilian clothes. Uh, wasn't worth almost anything. Very poor, just like beggars. <laughs> Why did you change your clothes with them? Uh, because I was afraid uh, to have a uniform. Already we heard that Ustashe are harassing and killing people of Serbian origin. And unfortunately, I was that. I was Serbian origin. I couldn't help. What, what can you do? Mm -hmm. You were born like that, and you know. <clears throat> so uh, we came to Vrgorac uh, in the evening, and it was very late. Uh, it was very dark. And the first patrol arrested us and took us to the camp. And after interviewing us and asking us a few questions, uh, they let us go. Was back. Were these Ustashi or no, Italians? No, no, this is Italian. Italian soldiers. Oh, Ustashi, I never, you would never see me around here. <laughs> Italian soldiers, they occupied that part mm -hmm. you know, of Dalmatia. And they said, Wabia. Wabia does mean go away. But where? Where? So I met a fellow, how he did uh, happen to be on the streets of the Vrgorac, uh, what's more, maybe three, four hundred people, maybe less even. How that happened, I don't know. But I did uh, say all these before. And uh, uh, he said, I said, uh, I said, please, do you have some lodging for me? I would like to have a, a night sleep, if I could. And he said, yeah, I have it, but my village is uh, about two, my house is about two kilometers or one and a half kilometers from here. I really didn't have any more strength. My, my feet were, were absolutely killing. But I gathered strength, you know, when, you, when the life is in question, then you just have some uh, undescribed power. And, uh, uh, we came to his house. He put me on the top in the attic, uh, with, uh, where he kept straw for the for the animals. I couldn't sleep. It was very chilly night. It was April. April sometimes does not to be very beautiful in Dalmatia, but at that time it was quite chilly. And about six o'clock, four o'clock, four between four and five, I heard some cracking of the fire, you know, when you start the fire and the wood starts to, how do you mm -hmm. call it in English, cracking, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I got up, the door of one small poor, poor house was uh, were opened and I knocked and entered. And, uh, a woman came and got up and asked, uh, are you the fellow whom, who's uh, whom my Ivo, Ivan, did uh, bring last night. I said, yes. She said, boy, I, I can't understand. Why didn't he give you his bed and he could have sleep with me? That was his her reaction. And fire was going on, beautiful fire. And she asked me, uh, am I hungry? And I said, certainly I am hungry. And she asked me, would you like some, uh, 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 they had uh, light bread from, uh, but wasn't bread. Polenta. Po polenta, that's right. And uh, It's cornmeal, isn't it? Cornmeal, yes. Yeah. Beautiful cornmeal at that mm -hmm. time, especially when you're hungry. With the milk or with the 
lard, and I said, with the lard. And uh, Palenta was called, but she put uh, lard and she prepared a dish like that. And I ate, it was so sweet. And after the exchange of the few words, and she told me about the bus for a split. Split is a quite beautiful uh, city on Adriatic Sea. And it is in the wrong direction of my uh, Shibanik and my village. And uh, I left there. She even offered me the money. And she said, uh, uh, certainly I know how do you feel. I am the mother. And I would like to give you whatever I have, just to ease your pains, because I know that your mother is worried. I came to Vrgorac and I met a fellow whom I was a very good friend with, uh, because he was so-called, he was from Istria. Istria was disputed territory between Yugoslavia and Italy, you know, and were nationalistic perils all the time uh, about Istria, and he escaped. He was a refugee, but he was pharmacist, he was an intellectual fellow, a nice fellow, and I was worried uh, for him. He was tenant, he was uh, lieutenant in the uh, uh, King's uh, Yugoslav army. Uh, but he said to me, don't worry, uh, Vaseline, don't worry, nothing will happen to me. Uh, I would like to offer you some money, because you will need money to pay the bus. And he gave me some money, and uh, I boarded the bus, and I had certainly hard time at the bus because very often uh, Ustashe came to check the bus. And uh, when so the, all this land is uh, is, is uh, uh, Dalmatia, but under Italians. But still, Ustashe were uh, uh, were in those first days very powerful. First days of so Italy. Italy was. Uh, um, was occupied, occupied, occupied. So by this time the war is over. Oh no, God bless you. The war just started. No, I mean, oh, uh, oh, first of uh, certainly, war is over. Oh, yes. Oh, no. And I came to Split after many checks by Ustersche. They came on the front door, we were on the back. And uh, I had beside me one uh, fellow. Dalmatian fellow as well, who said, well, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, I'll first answer if they ask something. Maybe they will ask. Uh, uh, they will not ask you at all. But they never came at the back. And they never asked. They just, with a, a, with a lantern, you know, with a the light, they came. A light on, on a gasoline. Mm -hmm. those, uh, and... Um, I came to split at a, just five minutes before the train was leaving for Shivanik. I was so happy and lucky. <laughs> and, um, I boarded the train. I came at Shivanik at four o'clock. But where to go now? Italians are occupiers. They are there. <laughs> you know, it's a very hard to move around. This is uh, just war ended few few days, about six, seven, eight days, something like that. So I had a friend who was living, fortunately, on the same street from the station to the town. And uh, I knocked at the door. Boy, they were frightened. Uh, this is four o'clock in the morning. Yes, they opened the door. When they saw me, they had the tears and a smile. Mm. Both of those things mixed. It was happy, very happy reunion. And after natural, they told me how much they feared. They really thought somebody came to to arrest them. Yeah, you know. Well, you can imagine. I mean, you can't imagine because you are a young fellow. And, uh, all that, all those are terrible experiences. At one o'clock. I boarded bus, bus the same bus which I was, with I boarded many times to go to my village and back to my village, but I had always to walk 
few kilometers from the road. Bus always gave, like here, bus, there are stops. If they have somebody, they stop. If they don't have somebody, some passenger, they don't stop, naturally. Mm -hmm. So I boarded and I came very late to my village. I was the last one I came. It was big happiness in my family, big happiness. Can you describe uh, the, the scene when you came home? Oh, it was a jubilation, especially mother. Especially she, she was so happy to see her son. Uh, they all feared that I was not alive because from all other villages, the was for next uh, neighboring village was uh, some fellow. He also finished schooling with me, teacher's college. He came home. Another village, he came home. Everybody came home, so they really taught themselves that I was killed. But thank God I wasn't. I appeared, I was alive, and that was very happy moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was life like in your hometown then? Well, it was very uh, great fears, very great fears. We lived uh, in fears all the time. On one side, we were uh, scared uh, of Italians. Uh, they were establishing the, their uh, authority and uh, uh, they uh, introduced their own language. They sent teachers to my village. He approached me. We teachers for teacher was from Istria, very nice fellow, and he used to say all the time. I wasn't uh, uh, free to tell him, uh, you know, what I thought. But he always was saying, I would like that these war ends, that you be happy and that I be happy, both of us to be happy. So he was very nice fellow, uh, and then. Uh, everything was fine until that one day. Uh, oh, uh, I had a relative in Skradin, that is a small village, and uh, we belong to that community. It's called Skradin, Skradin Skopstina, community of Skradin, like here, Windsor, mm -hmm. a city of Windsor. And we, uh, I went all the time there to gather, to get news. What is the new, how the war is going? Is there any chance for our freedom and so on? How did you get n uh, by news walk, from there? By walk. And who would you see? My, uh, my cousin, who was a lawyer, uh, a very well-known lawyer, he had radio. In mm -hmm. those days, it wasn't te television, it was just a radio. And uh, in Skradin, they had electricity, so he had a uh, radio and he informed me many times but this was very uh, because of that villagers were suspicious to me uh, already they were fo uh, being formed uh, uh, sympathies toward uh, partisans uh, uh, who were uh, mobilizing one by one of their sympathizers uh, in the units, and they were sending them in the units in uh, uh, in forests, in forests, in the hidden places. And uh, they were suspicious of my going to town. And one day, one fellow, uh, Marco Subasic, Subasic Marco, I couldn't remember last time the, the name, he got the order to kill me. And uh, he said, I had already my shotgun aimed at you, but suddenly I started to think, why should I bring, uh, kill my friend Dobrota? We were good friends before the war. We were the same organization, so-called organization. And he said, I decided not. This fellow told me when we had secret meeting in 1944, before the, 1943, at the village from where he was. We were on the guard there, uh, and uh, he asked uh, 
to meet with me, and I agreed. I gathered courage, and nothing happened to me. Thank God, I was in their village, in their territory, partisan territory, and uh, you know. So hmm. um, then, so you uh, were accused of being a spy. Yes. Uh, Did you I was accused? Did you associate yourself with any side? No. Partisans oh, or the Chinese? Bless me, no. I just went to my cousin to get the news. I never, never. That is last thing in my life. What I would, <laughs> what I would do for anything. No money in the world could buy my idealism and my ideas. Ever, 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 never was it. I sacrificed my country for uh, that reason. And I told you after. I mean, if you do have that there. I told the after in the partisans that they asked me to spy on my people again, and I, I, I just couldn't, that's all. And that was one among the most important decision, decisions that I leave my country in 1945. That mm -hmm. was. Then uh, I was uh, arrested just for a few hours by very powerful men whom I knew and who knew me. He went to school in Shibenik, Sima Dubaijan, and he came to the. He commanded um, not battalion, but brigade, you know, quite a big unit. And he was very successful. He was fanatic, communist fanatic. He started to be pioneer of 14 years of age. And uh, uh, was. Uh, one of uh, those people who would kill anybody if you don't follow his uh, footsteps. And, said. and he sent the guard three people, armed people, partisans. They were stationed uh, at the church uh, uh, building in my village. They sent, he sent for me, and I said, uh, when I came, he said to me, I want you to join. I said, Simo, I cannot participate in the civil war. I don't like to be mad. I, I am not convinced that you are right. I'm sorry. You are right as far as the enemy is concerned. And, but as far as uh, war between us, that I maybe think differently than you. You have no right to kill me, and I don't have a right to kill you. So we even argued a little bit, and he said, you will join my units, and after you teach my comrade soldiers uh, 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 writing and reading, then I'll kill you. But that evening, he, he didn't do anything. He said, go home and think about this. <laughs> I went home. And after a few days, Ustashi attacked my village. I just heard, and I escaped from neighboring village. That was already that Italy was losing uh, last the power and uh, changing the hands between Italy and Germany and so on. So, and I went and joined uh, Chetnik unit uh, in. Uh, Skradin, which, which was called the uh, Skradinska Brigada, uh, just unit of the Chetniks. And I was uh, named uh, as national, uh, they said, Povyarenik. Uh, I don't know what kind of the word the translation would be proper, really. But I had to overlook about the uh, education of our, uh, of our struggle. I, uh, idea parts, ideology. What was our ideology? Why did we join that? Uh, so I based everything on democratic uh, principles, on the freedom of the of the uh, men, and uh, I tried to convince them that they don't fight to steal something, to make any personal gains, that they fight for their people, and they have to be, that they have to be really respected as a good 
honest fighters all the time. So that was the one of the reasons that they I, that they had this uh, national pobereni. That's in comparison with a uh, with uh, much less power than uh, uh, commissars at uh, partisan units because they had partisan. So we were, I was uh, 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 What year was this taking place? Well, that was 1944, 1944, 1943 in, uh, what was, uh, no, 44, 1944, 45, when the war ended, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, I was uh, captured, captured, I'm sorry, so sometime, I was captured in 1944 at Losowitz. And uh, I was put uh, uh, first in the jail, and after jail I had my hearing and uh, court. Uh, Tell us uh, first about the boy Marshall. That, Marshall. that you saved. Pardon? Tell us first about the boy that you saved. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, uh, in, uh, during that uh, period of time, one evening, uh, three uh, Chetniks uh, came and said that they had a boy captured the boy, he was courier, and he was courier, but he was 13 or 14 years old, and they manipulated as they liked with those small children, you know, they called them pioneers. And I said, my goodness, nobody will kill this, or nobody will arm this fellow. I said, remember, you have the children as well, or if you would, um, don't have your own children, maybe that you have uh, your brother as, a, as such, or I used all kinds of the words, I really can't, but I was very successful. I said, before you kill me, and then, eh, there I had respect as a national, and as national Poyerenik, you know, they listened mm -hmm. to me, and thank God it was that way, so. So did they release the boy then? Yes, oh, nothing happened, just let him uh, uh, go. I visited his house and his mother. His mother so thanked me so much that uh, Abella, you can imagine, my goodness, yeah. uh, imagine uh, being mother and to see the, the child uh, being persecuted or something, nothing happened. They, didn't, they even didn't slap the boy, nothing, absolutely nothing. And it was, uh, you know, a very important part of, the, of their military operations or anybody. Courier is very important to bring, <laughs> sure. Uh, and then uh, I was captured and I was put in the jail and, uh, in Shibenik. Uh, I was at the camp uh, uh, two months there when amnesty came. They used us to, for physical labor to unload uh, uh, mostly supplies, but mostly army supplies, uh, uh, arms. And did you ever see this in boy? In Shibenik, pardon? I'm sorry, uh, did you ever see the boy again? I saw the boy. Uh, I saw the boy um, during the transfer from the jail, or entering the jail, entering of the jail. When he saw me, he was so surprised. He was surprised it was, that I was captured, and he grabbed me around and mm. says, "Boy," he says, "My God," he says, uh, "You are the fellow who saved my life." And he emphasized that, you know, he emphasized that. So from there we went to jail, uh, to the court, and they uh, Do you think sentenced me to five years of last of the civic rights, citizens' right or civic rights, you cannot vote, and three years in the jail, but after two months, and then put us in the camp and used us as physical labor and every morning we went uh, down to the, the to the dock yard to unload uh, uh, English uh, uh, ships with the arms and with the food, and back to the camp. 
and uh, uh, from there came amnesty. Amnesty came that uh, they wanted all these people to join their armed forces and to fight for them. And I was sent to Knin at that time. And at Knin, I was. Uh, <coughs> uh, they wanted to send me to uh, to unit, but one fellow came who was political delegate. That's lower rank than political commissar. He said, Druja captain, uh, Dru uh, comrade captain, I need com comrade Dobrota. And that was all. See how powerful he was. Captain was nothing in comparison of, uh, of this, this fellow, although this it was the in, lowest uh, rank in their political hierarchy in the army. The partisan. Yes, partisan, sure. And he said, I need uh, to know how to interruption, inter interpunction, uh, comma, and uh, that is how Punctuation. You, punctuation, yes. yes. Punctuation. And I need uh, uh, arithmetic a little bit. And that was, I, he says, uh, comrade, don't forget, I was political commissar, but I was degraded because demoted, uh, because I, uh, I just uh, didn't know these things. I didn't know how to compose a uh, letter or order or any mm -hmm. information or something like that. And so he really saved me. That evening, that evening, we were killed on the road by frost, by weather, not by enemies. An actor, very famous doctor in that part of the uh, uh, region, Dr. Grubishich, and 28 soldiers and 20 horses was all frozen, just going across a mountain which was very well known even if today. There is nothing, it is just like tundra. Nothing grows on that mountain because there are all kinds of the winds and the storms, wind storms during the winter. And this was January 1945. So uh, we were, I, I was, I spent in Knin teaching this fellow two months. In March, they send us to Zadar. That is, you hear right now on the news of Zadar. Zadar is a beautiful spot on Dalmatian uh, shore, and it was uh, before the World War Number Second belonged to Italy after the World War One, and that was uh, Porto Franco was called. That is same thing like uh, free duty here when you go and buy the mm -hmm. almost free thing, half, <laughs> yeah. half money at that time, everything, even Yugoslavian or Italian, you could buy very, very cheap. So, but anyhow, that's uh, uh, what was connected. We went to the Zadar, and uh, at the Zadar, I, uh, oh, on, on my way down there, I met, uh, my very good, uh, actually, uh, almost like relative, he was minister, orthodox minister in uh, in uh, Jevorske. And he had, his son went to school with me and they were all partisans, except minister. Even his wife was. They were just, uh, that was uh, at that time trend, that's all. But he was very nice to me and he said to me, you know, Veselin, these are worse than yours, means that partisans were, even people who were doing worse things than we had. We, we, we were known as people, you know, fighters, uh, uh, freedom fighters always do some things beside those which are not sometimes very popular and very mm -hmm. nice and so on. So he told me that. He invited me for lunch, I went up there, and from there on we proceeded to uh, to Zadar. At Zadar, I got, uh, they gave me position at the, uh, <coughs> first aid unit. Right. Oh, that was wonderful because you don't need to fight, you are just, you know, you are exposed to the, certainly, but it is a little bit better spot to be mm -hmm. than in the front lines. 
but after just one hour after that, uh, commissar of the division sent for me. And who was commissar? The best friend from my school days and from my so-called days, Peter Troskut. He was a huge fellow, very tall, very tall, yes. you know. And uh, he said, Druzhe, Cameron, who did send you to first aid unit? I said, Drug Zivkovic. Drug Zivkovic was Kamrad Zivkovic. Kamrad Zivkovic was political commissar of the, un of the, of the battalion. Uh, he said, do you know that you did fight against our national army, liberation, national liberation army? Uh, I said like this, I'm just, tomorrow you are going to be taken to join fighting units and to prove your, uh, <clears throat> uh, to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. So he, this is supposedly your best friend taking yes, you yes. out of the first No, time. absolutely bored. How you are, where have you been all this time, what you did, nothing. Absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. You know, like stone. That yeah. is what I couldn't ever, 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 and I cannot. Any ideology which is like that, I cannot accept. That's all. Can't. I never could, even when he's in question, when was in question of my life. I couldn't. But anyhow, we went, and I got a good, two good armen, I mean, uh, uh, security men to take me, or how you call them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need a little bit of concentration. <laughs> well, that's all right, you're doing fine. <laughs> and uh, I got two wonderful people. We went to my Shibani, where I graduated, where I had very many friends from Sokol and other. They offered me money. They invited me for dinner, for lunch. And this fellow says, says, stay two, three days. I said, how can we stay? God bless you. He said, they are going to kill us. <laughs> we have to be at the unit. So from there, we went to back to clean again. You know, that is really circle again, mm -hmm. to the, back to, to the clean. I got my unit, but in the morning, he a small fellow, he was common there. He was managing that, or how do you call it? combat, uh, combat the unit. unit. Yeah. He was from Shibanik himself, a small fellow. He says, Comrade Dobrot, I see you, you have some kind of education. I have nobody, nobody here to take record of anything. Who knows? So would you like to, would you like to do that? I said, sure. So I became secretary of the unit. <laughs> oh, God bless me, that's all. And we kept our uh, archives, you know, documents and uh, a list of the people and those who were killed and everything else. It was has to be taken. And every morning, I called them, roll call, every morning, every evening as well. And from then on, we went to the to the war, really war. We went through the Lika. One evening was uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful weather. Somebody appeared on the horse. It was my old friend from school days. He tried everything possible to convert me to communist ideas. And I, I just couldn't. And we departed. He told me, I see, Vaseline, I cannot do anything with you. But I recognize you are idealist in your ideology. I am, believe me, I'm in my, etc. But he said, they didn't kill you yet, huh? Oh, I said, Vinko, his name was Minko, Minko Maglitsa. He was son of the fellow who was uh, making uh, barrels for the wine. I do remember their small house and his small shop in Shibani was very bright fellow, very bright. They devoted all their life a little bit to school and that is to build ideology and to spread that to spread uh, to spread that ideology through the people. As saver, 
day he said, you know that Russia is celebrating million tanks, that they are uh, seeding the vast fields from airplanes. It was 1935, 36, 37, mm -hmm. and so on. It was where only fascist ideology and communists and communists were very active in my school. Uh, these democratic people with the democratic ideas were very passive, and there were only few, only few. That's all. But okay. So uh, before the uh, after that we went, we came to Trieste, pretty close to Trieste. Uh, truce was announced. But Winko Magotza didn't, uh, didn't agree with it. He says, I want to kill more Germans. Yeah, but it, it is OK if you want to kill with yourself, yourself but uh, you are exposing uh, people to that. And he went to the last fight, and he was very badly hurt, very hurt, badly hurt. And, uh, after that, in the there, I, I, I told him, this is a very classical case, believe me, very classical case. One fellow tall, like a giant, young, 23, 24. They ordered him on the, on the field. There is no any, it is just plain. Nothing, nothing, no, no trees, nothing to hide, nothing. To make, uh, to make run, toward enemy lines with a very heavy machine gun, very heavy. I don't know how, how, how heavy it was, but uh, it, it was quite heavy, you know, to, for one man to, to carry that. And thank God that man survived. And in the morning, we were all gathered, and they gave him citation for, uh, they read uh, him as a, and he told me so before he, that they wanted to kill me, they said, he said. He knew that. He was also a former Chetnik, you know. He, he said, hey, I knew that. And uh, was another classical case. Oh, and this is what I forgot last time. And God help me if this is not all this true, what I'm saying to you. I never will. Uh, I wish I'm better in writing so that I write, put on the paper all this. One morning, I came among the com uh, uh, soldiers there. And they were talking, and they said, if we would know that we are going to stay here another two years, we would kill ourselves, rather commit suicide, rather than the, the wait that two years, because this is impossible, absolutely impossible. They were so much brainwashing that no, I don't think so, that anybody, anybody can imagine that, or uh, any <laughs> a very great brain can write about this. This was so done. Uh, I don't know, did they have some kind of the theory about that or something, but they wanted to make from you uh, just machine to do everything what they wanted. Machine that you don't think. You and managed to escape that, though. Pardon? You, you managed to escape that yes, brainwashing. Yes, yes. No, no. I, 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 I had a part. For that reason, I escaped beside that. Also, one morning, in that, right now I'm talking about period when I was, when a war ended. We are in the Trieste, are stationed in, a, near Trieste, stationed in the unit. Every morning we had a lesson. Every morning. Um, and they called me and they wanted from me to be a spy. And they offered all kinds of the money. They offered all kinds of the, of the suits, beautiful suits. Well, you know how spy can, uh, can have everything, right? To go to Italy, to go uh, back to Yugoslavia. And after the war, a uh, comrade, they said, you will be supervisor of the schools. You will not be ordinary teacher, you know? It was hard time. And every morning after that, they asked me every three, four days, not every morning, what I did see, what I did notice. I said, I, I, I said maybe that 
because I am I was Chetnik, they don't show anything because they are afraid maybe. You know, that is how I I did uh, succeed to uh, to fight their curiosity mm -hmm. about what people are talking and so on. I never told them anything. And because of that I decided to go to leave my country, to leave my family. I was very close to my mother. Uh, I was the youngest one alive in my family, youngest one. I had all kinds of the lab, all kinds. It was really hard decision. And I didn't know anything, although I, I, uh, I, I graduated teaching college, I didn't know about the world, anything, right. almost anything. So I decided. And I found a friend in the, it, there is in, in the vicinity of Zadar, small village, it's called Arbanasi. And this fellow was named Krsto Perovic, oh, Slavic. The name and surname, but they were in the past uh, Slavic origin, and after they were Italianized, or how do you call it? And he didn't know anything but Italian language, was a very nice man. We entrusted each other ideas to each other, and we made a decision to escape. He suggested train. I said no. <clears throat> train to go in a, for a, a, a locomo uh, this <clears throat> machine, you know, which pulls. Uh, uh, how do you call that machine? Which uh, pull? The locomotive. Yeah, locomotive. <clears throat> I said no. So to be there with uh, with a man who is uh, yeah. managing that, I said no. You know that communists. I said no everything, and I'm sure they have spies there because very many people were, every day, were escaping in those days, every day. So we decided to go by foot. We took some kind of the uh, uh, bottles for milk. Uh, in the case that we are caught, we are going to say that we went to neighboring village to buy milk, mm -hmm. to get milk. And we succeeded. We, uh, we saw, when I saw those, uh, un, uh, uh, these courts, you know, for telephone, uh, field telephones, army telephones, they are different colors. I saw, I, I saw in, from uh, behind every bush, I saw soldier. That is in my imagination. And I said, if I am caught, I'm finished. There is no more. I was once at the, at the their court and so on. So we succeeded. We came first time for among first refugees at the Red Cross. They started to ask us information. Nothing. We didn't give them anything. Who are we are? So just can we get night sleep? And they said yes. So we asked for a train for Bologna, and they gave us the schedule. It was four o'clock in the morning. We boarded the train, just uh, platforms. It wasn't anything else. And we were very happy. We came to Treviso. My goodness, Treviso were, was all placards, big signs, Viva il Tito, long live Tito. I said, my goodness, we are again in communist territory. <laughs> that was This big. was in Italy. It was Italy, Treviso. You know, where mm -hmm. at these crossroads. We just slept there in the camp. We didn't trust there at all. So we went from there to Venezia, beautiful spot, Venezia. At Venezia, we did, uh, uh, I went to Swiss consulate. Mm -hmm. They directed me that, my friends, some of those people there in, uh, in uh, Venezia. And I had to lie. I'll tell you the truth, and that is first time and last time that I lied. But I lied to get some money. I didn't have anything, and they gave me thirteen hundred dollars. I did lie that I came from the camp. They could see that I wasn't a, a camp fellow, you know. Camp concentration fellow was, camp. Yeah, concentration German. They were all exhausted people. I mean, uh, suffered you see on their faces and so. On. But they gave me money. 
only I told them the truth 100% who it was my father, my father was Damian, my mother was Yelena, everything. I gave them all those So I was cared after for them, but they got nothing happened. Uh, in the morning, I bought bun, fresh bun, and bun tomato. And that was sweeter of anything in the world on market in Venezia. And then I, uh, at noon, we got at uh, nuns' re monastery, some monastery where nuns were so meal made, yeah. every day. Meal, a good meal. But in the evening, nothing. And uh, we slept under, in the other, some place in the attic as well. So I spent there about uh, four or five weeks. And after that, a uh, Polish army truck took me to, uh, to Jesena. From there, I went to Eboli. From Eboli, we went, to, uh, I was sent to the <coughs> unit, Chetnik unit, which was captured. They were from Herzegovina, captured by Germans. They were taken to Greece used as a labor. Uh, naturally, when uh, Germany withdrew from, uh, from uh, Greece, uh, they came, they refused to go back to Yugoslavia. Uh, they came back and I was uh, given a task to explain to them operations and uh, ideology of the Chetniks from uh, when they were captured in 43 to end of the 45, okay. end of the war. And in Italy, unfortunately, uh, when I escaped, my people were asking people whom I knew how come that I was alive if I was such a good Chetnik and patriot, how come I was spared life? And they, they again, they say, you are a spy. And they uh, gave information to Italian authorities. And one morning in the camp where I was, 400 soldiers, Italian soldiers, tanks, encircled and arrested about 50 of us. And whole Italy was sounding all day on the news where how they were successful to discover <laughs> communist plot. Oh, my goodness. So they thought you were involved That's right. in the communist yes. plot? Yes, communist plot. And they sent us to Lipar. That was famous place for political uh, prisoners. Prisoners. There is about thirty people, thirty yards to the sea, thirty yards wall and sea. And that's it. You just look at those big, big walls. And Council of the World Churches. Thank God, I knew very well. Well, I knew my bishop uh, from Dalmatia, his name was Irina Georgievic, and uh, uh, he sent some delegates. They visited us. Was even in British Parliament a question why we were arrested and what is being done that we get free and so on. And finally, they didn't, Italians didn't want to, to admit that they were at the fault. One by one, they let us.